Well, good evening, everyone. Um, this is an online seminar for the Geopolitics and Ecology of the Himalaya Water Initiative, which is a joint collaboration of NYU Abu Dhabi and the Rachel Carson Center. Uh, it's called Bearing Witness, Human Footprint on the Himalaya. Uh, my name is Ruth Gamble. I'm an environmental and cultural historian at, of the Himalaya and Tibet. I'm based at La Trobe University in Australia. Uh, this land is known as Nam by its original inhabitants, the Wiradjuri people, and uh, also known as Melbourne. Uh, I'd like to pay my respects to the Wiradjuri people of the Kulin Nation, whose land I'm speaking to you from, and acknowledge that they never ceded sovereignty, and I want to pay my respects to their elders past and present. Uh, so I'm speaking from Melbourne, but our guest tonight is uh, the, the focus of the talk of the seminar is uh, Dawa Stephen Chopper. He's a mountaineer and adventurer and entrepreneur. He's ascended Mount Everest three times as well as four other 8,000 meter peaks. So, you know, a real underachiever. He's trekked uh, 1,555 kilometers, a very specific number, the entire length of the Nepal Himalaya along the Great Himalayan Trail in 99 days. And he, Dao is a globally recognized environmentalist and has been running the Echo Everest expedition since 2008. And they've got a lot of attention because uh, they're the people that organized to have 23,000 kilos of rubbish removed from Everest or Chomolamo and other 8,000 meter peaks. Uh, so he's a really interesting guy and hopefully we're gonna have a great conversation. And so I'd like to uh, welcome Dawa, who is talking to us tonight from Kathmandu. How are you, Dawa? Hi, Ruth. Thanks very much. Uh, great. Yeah. Uh, excited <laughs> to be here. Talk to you all. Yeah, <laughs> that's great. And is it, you look like it's cold in, in Kathmandu at the moment. Uh, yeah, it's uh, quite cold. Uh, not as cold as the mountains. I was just not uh, as there cold a couple of days ago. <laughs> but, right. Um, so, yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so that was the first thing I wanted to ask about, and that is um, how is the Everest or Chomolamo region responding to, or how's it going through the COVID um, issues? How has the pandemic and the shutdown affected the region? Well, um, you know, like everywhere else in the world, um, everybody's a bit nervous about it, but more so, I think, in the Everest region because um, it's, uh, you know, it's um, a very tight knit community there um, and we're at high altitude. So people are kind of afraid because it's already, you know, difficult to breathe. And so they're afraid like, you know, um, the vulnerable in, in society are going to be extra, you know, it's going to hit them extra hard because, it, you know, the altitude issues and so on. So um, we, we didn't have the COVID um, virus there for the longest time and it suddenly showed up a month ago. And all the villagers went into shutdown. You know, they, they locked, locked the, uh, themselves uh, out. Um, you know, they, they closed the bridges and, you know, even travel between the villagers, um, the, even travel between the villages was stopped for a while, right. which, which brought mm. a lot of, you know, um, friction between villagers. So it wasn't very good. But now, you know, the, the COVID uh, cases have gone down. There's no more COVID again in the Everest region now. So people have started to relax. But that's you know that's just the health side the bigger problem yeah. right now is that we we don't have tourists and the Everest region completely relies on tourism well almost completely relies on tourism and now we are very very nervous because there's been a, an entire year that the local people have had no income so that is that is the major issue right now yeah, it's, it's, it really is always a, a trade-off, isn't it? You have to deal with a health crisis, but then once the health crisis goes, if your tourism is being uh, is uh, being um, affected all over the, the 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 region, it's really really a complicated issue. So so that sounds to me as though the um, the the people of the region are very dependent on tourism now. And um, as I understand it, that dependency on tourism has been exaggerated by uh, the, the climate crisis, which is um, also uh, affecting the region. And the two, and so COVID and the climate crisis are, must be playing off each other then. Yeah, absolutely. Um... So um, if you don't know already, the Everest region is home to the Sherpas. So I'm part of you know, the Sherpa community 
and the Sherpas are world famous for taking mountaineers or tourists up, you know, yeah. um, up Mount Everest and, and other peaks. Now, since nobody is able to come there, um, come to the come to Nepal and come to the mountains, um, many of the Sherpas have had to rely on the uh, on the only source of income they have right now, which is agriculture, the growing right. of, of crops. But this year we had a very heavy monsoon, and unfortunately the potato harvest um, was really really bad. Um, uh, you know, some of the people were saying that the, the, the potatoes are smaller than the than the seeds that they they planted. Wow! And what's now happening and uh, is that the supplemental income that they were making from the tourism has completely been wiped out and the heavy monsoon has wiped out their agricultural uh, income so they don't have anything to fall back on and this is making the whole situation worse right so mm. uh, in other places where people are not so reliant on the weather you know we could say you know anybody who lives in a big city you know who might have a, a relatively comfortable job in a, in a bank or something it doesn't really matter but you know the climate change impact is not so immediate but in the mountains where people rely completely on on, on nature the impact yeah. that COVID has had has made it even worse now yeah so which one do you think is a bigger threat then or the or do they play into each other the uh, the idea of losing tourists because of the pandemic or, or, or climate change and how it's affecting the region. Which one uh, do people see as a bigger threat? Um, so people, people currently see uh, COVID as the immediate threat, right? right. And not only to their own health, but also um, to their income. And uh, the, yeah. The, the, yeah. the fear is that if COVID continues and tourism you know, doesn't return to the Everest region for another year or another two years, goodness knows how long, mm -hmm. people are going to have to move out and find jobs in the city. And, and that is one threat. But the bigger fear and the, the bigger threat in the Everest region and has been for a long time recognized by the local people is climate change. Because we literally see our mountains changing in front of our own eyes, right? Yeah. And we yeah. know this is a, a big problem and it has been impacting us and we know it's gonna impact us even harder as uh, you know as time goes on right so okay so you uh, so can you just paint us a little bit of a picture um uh so the people know everest right like, so people are sitting in textbooks reading their textbooks in year five geography whether they're in australia or in america or in abu dhabi they know everest um but they know it kind of as an abstract yeah um can you tell us a little bit about how the communities live in this region the sharpa people who are of that of that region uh, where do they live and how do they live uh, around the mountain yeah uh sure so um, the Sherpa people and many other mountain communities uh, live down valley or downstream from big mountains like Everest, right? And we rely, uh, first and foremost, we rely on the water that flows down from the glaciers. And um, those who are involved in the, in the trekking industry and the mountaineering industry uh, actually use or rather climb over or, or trek over the glaciers as well. Now, these glaciers are melting very fast. And not only is it you know, having an impact on tourism because all our, our trekking routes and our climbing routes are changing and making them more dangerous, also our water sources are dying out or dwindling. And this is, you know, this is a problem that, has, uh, that started a, a few decades ago, but now it's becoming worse and worse. So uh, right. right now, that is, the, that, that is for us a, a, a very important issue. And, um, not only is it is it you know a, a soft problem like you know I, I shouldn't say soft a slow problem like you know <laughs> slow problem yeah slowly drying out. Another big problem is that it's also turning into big lakes, right? The water is pooling up inside the glaciers and becoming big lakes, and they're bursting out and are threatening the lives, uh, well, the settlements and the lives of the people. So, yeah, not a not a pretty yeah, big, wow. big change right now. So it sounds like you've got two big problems, right? You've got things that you need to do right there and then in order to adapt to this that's happening. And, and hopefully at some stage, we can convince the planet to do something about climate change as well. But it's, 
in the meantime, it sounds like you've got immediate problems. So what do you think is, mm -hmm. a, is the biggest immediate problems that you have in the region? And, and yeah. Yeah. Um, so as, as a climate activist, um, I categorize uh, two uh, different st strategies. For us on the ground, for the local people, adaptation right now is the most important, is the most urgent. Yeah. Like I said, um, when your life is being threatened, you know, from a lake that could burst out and wash away everything you've got, well, that's first and foremost, we got to protect ourselves from that. So yeah. uh, things like um, glacier lake outburst floods, that is yeah. a, a major concern yeah. for the mountain communities. Landslides, landslides, because we're getting very irregular rain patterns, heavy monsoons. And so even in my own village in Kumjum, we, we've been getting big landslides coming through. And so this is, again, something that needs to be addressed right away. And the third thing is that we have heavy monsoons, but we have very dry uh, winter season. And the drought is lasting longer and longer, which is having a problem, uh, which is creating a problem for agriculture, but also um, a lot of forest fires are, are happening in Nepal. So again, uh, uh, wow. you know, these are the immediate things that we need to work on. But having said that, these are symptoms of climate change. Yeah, the yeah. Actual yeah. disease itself is the way humanity is set up at the moment. Mm. The whole world is set up, and we need to continue to knock on the doors of of um, regulators, of policymakers, to make sure that good uh, policies are put in place that uh, is going to re reverse climate change, and that is so, the so more important. That is a more important uh, thing to do, but the more, but what we need to immediate. do right now, the <laughs> yeah, yeah, adaptation. Yeah. So yeah. So there's two different levels that you're working on, and I think we will get into more detail about that in mm -hmm. in a bit. Where you know that this idea of immediate threats uh, for people, mm -hmm. you know, there's there's certain people around the world that climate change is hitting first, right? And and you guys are literally at the face of it. Um, it's it's really going to affect you. It is really affecting you, I should say. Um, so yeah, adaptation and, and, and then how you change people. But um, before we get into the, to the, to the weeds <laughs> about, about the details of, of those issues, um, it, we, it'd be great to know how you ended up doing this stuff, like removing tons of rubbish from Everest. It's not, yeah. it's not something that I'm guessing was in the playbook when you, you, know, you, you look up job descriptions. Um, that, you know, that doesn't come up. So, how, 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 what's your connection to uh, the Everest or Jomalama region, and how did you get involved in climbing, and uh, and how did you end up standing up on the top of um, to, uh, the, of the world's highest mountains? Um, so, I was born in Kathmandu in Nepal. Um, my father's Sherpa, as I might have mentioned earlier, uh, but my mother's Belgian. Um, right. And you know, she came in the in the 70s uh, as a trekker, uh, you know, and um, uh, she fell in love with the country. And later on, she fell in love with a man, a Sherpa man, who was my father. And um, uh, they started the company that I currently run, um, uh, the trekking company that I, that I currently run. And, uh, you know, my father, uh, he's a businessman, right? And he would say, like, the mountains are our assets, right? So any good business protects their assets. So we were always yeah, right. very, very concerned about, you know, uh, about the mountains, the mountain environment, because our customers, our clients came to the mountains to see beautiful, pristine mountains. And yeah. it was working against our own interests, not only as a business, but also as the Sherpa community, as, uh, as Nepal, uh, um, in the, uh, the tourist industry, if we are destroying our own mountains. So uh, it was always we were, we were always very conscious about protecting the environment, about doing the things right. Because if we yeah. don't, then tomorrow we don't have a business, right? So that was sort of you know from my father's business uh, perspective. Um, but um, my my family has been in the tourism industry for three generations now. My grandfather actually uh, was a good friend of Sir Edmund Hillary, um, and even accompanied the many of the first expeditions that went to uh, Mount Everest. And wow, um, that's quite my, the lineage. my grandfather, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> and uh, my, my grandfather used to say, uh, the mountains have always protected the Sherpa people um, because we consider it mm -hmm. a, a sacred valley, right? Um, 
there's a long history. Ruth, you know all about it, but there's a long history behind, you know, why it's considered a sacred valley. But basically the mountains protected the Sherpa people in, in times of trouble. And my grandfather used to say the, the mountains have always protected uh, the Sherpa people. The Sherpa people now have to protect the mountains. Protect so it was ingrained yeah. in, in, in my family, in my DNA, that we need to, you know, uh, we need to look after the mountains just as they have looked after us. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. So, so there's, so there's this sense of you got drawn. It's, when I ask you about how you end up climbing mountains, you're already talking about the environment. So we can see that it's like a really pressing issue. Um, but there's a, there's not, you may think it's normal to grow up climbing the world's highest mountains, but for everybody else, it's not. Um, so I'm sure that they, the people listening would be a bit cranky at me if I didn't ask you um, it, what, what it feels like or how you, um, how you, how it changes you. Uh, mm. to start climbing these mountains oh wow um yeah did, did you ever think you wouldn't climb them or was it just something that was going to happen uh, yeah you know uh, we are we are three brothers and i'm the middle right. child right so apparently i was always the one that was getting into trouble climbing things you know, <laughs> even as a kid i was yeah. climbing onto the roof of the house and so on <laughs> so if you ask my mother you know she she always knew i was going to climb Everest someday right um, but um you know, um, we, we, like I said, you know, uh, uh, my family had a trekking business. And so we had some of the most amazing climbers come through, um, you know, who worked with my father. And mm -hmm. so for someone like me who was interested in the mountain from a very young age, it was sort of like meeting Ronaldo or Messi, you know? Um, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. You, it's just something like, I, I got to do it. Um, and yeah. the first time I went to the Everest region, I was six years old. And I still have that memory, you know, um, of being on my grandfather's horse as he took me up to the village. Uh, I climbed, the first time I climbed, uh, you know, did rock climbing when I was 11. And then when I climbed Everest for the first time, I was 22 years old. Um, so and do of course, we have a lot a, of climbing I, in between. I oh, think yes, we've uh, got a photo, yeah. Uh, Rona, can, uh, can you share uh, some of the photos I, I sent you earlier? So go. is this you on, on the mountain then? Yeah, that's me on the mountain. Um, so uh, this was in 2011 or 12. Um, I've led 14 expeditions on Everest uh, since I first wow. climbed. I mean, I went to the top three times, but normally right. as, a, so as a leader and as with, with the cleaning up and all that, I have other responsibilities as well. So I don't always yeah. go to the top. So right. That's me there. <laughs> but you can't, you can't really recognize me with a mask. You, could, and, I, I, you will just tell people it's me, so you can't tell. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, yeah. that's definitely you, right? Yes. Yeah. Uh, and um, and and you're taking. You're not just walking up there, though. You're taking people up there. That's like a big responsibility, right? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I'm I'm always leading a group, right? Um, so yeah. Uh, it, 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 that was one of the sort of um, uh, when I first climbed, I saw there was a lot of problems, but like you know when. Uh, I saw so first and foremost, right. Um, There's a lot of garbage when I when I first went to climb there. Right. And yeah. I was taking people up there, and uh, I wanted to do something about it. But it's very very expensive to do anything on the mountain, right? I mean, to, yeah, interesting. To, yeah. Just to organize an expedition. So uh, a lot of my Sherpas were, you know, guiding the the climbers individually. So when they're going up, they're carrying a lot of stuff, and then setting up camps, and then coming back down again. Uh, to get their clients to take back up. So when they're coming back down after setting up camp, uh, they were always they always had empty rucksacks. And so I, the idea came to me to clean yeah. the mountain by asking the Sherpas, you know, if you see any garbage, why don't you put it in your backpack and bring it down? And, uh, you know, we'll weigh it and everybody will get, you know, a, a, a dollar a kilo. And so that's how I started, you know, cleaning up the mountain, actually. Fantastic. So, so, so th this is really linked together then, right? You've got this, um, love for the mountain that is is clearly linked to your family's tradition of that you mm. look after the mountain, the mountain looks after mm. you. And so you're incorporating environmental um, protections and, and work into it uh, when you're mm. up there. Is this you as well in this photo? Uh, this, is me, this is me taking, um, uh, this is me who took the picture. And that is, the guy in the red is one of my clients and the other gentleman in the back is one of my Sherpas. So like I was saying, you know, uh, every Sherpa accompanies one client. Yeah. And so yeah. uh, like uh, a client would normally go up uh, three times just to, you know, go up 
uh, to camp one, come back down, rest, and then go up a little higher to camp two, come back down, rest before they go to the summit. So we do rotations right. to acclimatize to the altitude. But a Sherpa does it maybe six to 10 times. You know, they and, and when you're up, up there, the so mm -hmm. come back down. And when you're up there, mm -hmm. so you're like focused, I need to focus on getting the rubbish off the mountain mm -hmm. and I need to make sure no one gets hurt and I need to make sure everything runs. Do you actually have moments where you're like, like, I was going to swear, but I won't because it's, you know, international. Yes. Oh, goodness, I'm on top of the mountain. Ah, does that kind of, uh, or, or is it kind of a, I don't know, spiritual feeling or, or, or what what's going through your head or you don't get a chance to reflect? Um, yeah, uh, uh, there are times when I go, you know, what the hell am I doing? You know, to, you know I've bitten <laughs> off more than I can chew. There right. are definitely moments like that. You know, it's uh, one of the most difficult places in the world to work. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. You yeah. Can hardly, yeah. You can hardly even raise your, you know, your, your feet up to take the next step, let alone do all uh, these things. But uh, there are definitely times when I say, oh, man, I want to pack this all in. This is too, too much for me. But then, you know, yeah, when, right. when, when it all works out, you know, you know uh, when, when you finish the expedition has been a big success, you know, I can't wait to go back up there again. Yeah. Yeah, right. So there's, yeah, it's a it, it's an intense job, but one that has these great mm. rewards. And and we're getting shown photos of the um, mm. one of the camps, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, yep. So 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 you were saying that you also have to your part of your job isn't just taking people up; it's also cleaning up after them, making sure everything's packed away as well. Yeah. Um, so it, it's every uh, every team's for, uh, responsibility to clean up them uh, after themselves, right? That that, right. that goes without yeah. saying. Um, but there are a lot of people who haven't done that for various reasons. It's not always malicious. It's not that people, you know, deliberately leave garbage. Sometimes circumstances just means they have to abandon camps and so on. So since 2008, I've been cleaning up uh, on Mount Everest. Um, so not my garbage, but other people's garbage uh, uh, mostly. And that's, you know, the garbage, like we've got over 23 tons of garbage off of Everest and other 8,000 meter peaks so far. Um, and it's, it's a very fulfilling, uh, fulfilling uh, feeling, but at the same time, it also, I, I, I'm also aware that a lot of people think that Mount Everest is the dirtiest mountain. Um, it was, it certainly yeah. was at one point. Um, uh, when I started, there was because, because it was so popular. Oh, sorry. Yeah, is it, it was, was it dirty because it was, yeah, right, right, yeah. Um, but today, uh, because of efforts like mine and various other uh, organizations and teams, uh, Everest is one of the cleanest mountains now, and definitely, I, I believe, definitely uh, the cleanest uh, of the seven summits. So right. that, we do have that going for us. But the media, of course, likes to say, oh, Everest is, a, is the world's highest garbage dump and so on. Um, yeah, but it's not really yeah, a story you know, saying they're the clean mountain. You know, no, that's there's, no, not there's, really. there's no real story <laughs> in saying Everest is the clean mountain, right? So <laughs> there is that as well. I'm very aware that... But that uh, oh. mm -hmm. Sorry, I was going to say, but this kind of what what I'm hearing from you and is actually quite moving is that there's this um, intense relationship between the people of the region who you're connected to, your family, your uh, lineage, uh, your family lineage, and all, 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 all the community, and um, the community's been working together to clean this place up, right? Mm -hmm. So you're asking them, they're bringing them the uh, um, the rubbish down with them. So there, there does seem to be some kind of survivalist as well as um, uh, ethical uh, idea of, of, of helping the mountain. Yeah, um, you know, we consider the mountain holy, right? We consider all mountains holy, in fact. And yeah. before we Sherpas climb any mountain, we do a big prayer ceremony, uh, a puja, right. right? And so it's very important for us to go on the mountain with clean thoughts, right? With, with a good heart, and with, that, with the intention to not do harm, right? Because that's one of the things we promise when we do the puja, right? Yeah. We, we yeah, apologize yeah. To, to our gods and goddesses that we're going to be stepping on their roof, so, but we don't mean right. you any harm. So uh, right. we do actually try as much as possible, you know, to have a positive impact, which is, you know, take away all our garbage and, uh, and, and even take away other people's garbage. But it's not always possible. I mean, it's not always possible if you're, you know, if you're suffering, if there's a big, uh, you know, big storm coming through or something like that. So, you know, it's, it's, it's easier said than done a lot of the time. Yeah. But all Sherpas, given the choice, and in fact, all mountaineers, given the choice, 
uh, and the correct circumstances would rather take away all their garbage, right? Would rather yeah. have a positive impact than a negative impact, right? So mm. yeah, yeah, no, it's it's quite extraordinary, yeah, and it does seem like that there is this. It's developed the relationship with the place, with as you said it previously. Um, you're dependent on nature, you're dependent on the environment for mm. your well-being. So then you want the environment and you want to protect um, what's around you. It's kind of survivalist as well as environmentalist, mm. it seems. Yeah. But that, but that's going to move, moving on to the, getting back to the, some of the details. Um, if we can just talk a little bit, uh, ask you some questions about the adaptation um, that, mm. the, that people, the, the real threats that people have. Mm -hmm. um in the region the real threat so it's mainly the shop was living in, up in this area area right mm -hmm. it's mainly like uh is it that was more like a question it's more the yeah uh, um so in the, in the high himalaya at least in the everest region it's mostly sherpas but there yeah. are other communities as well you know um, right uh, i don't know if the name well it will mean something to you ruth but of course there's tibetans on the north side uh, sure. you know, yeah. there's uh, botes uh, towards the east there are gurungs so there's various yeah. different ethnic groups living around up in the high Himalayas. So it's not just Sherpas. Um, not just, but, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. In the Everest region specifically, uh, it's uh, all Sherpa uh, settlements. Yeah. Sherpa. And, and there's this, and so, so if we, I mean, they're all dealing with similar threats then. And yeah. uh, you, so we're gonna talk a little bit about the, if we mm. can just talk a little bit about these threats and the sure. adapt, like the, the adaptations that the Sherpa people mm. have to make um, to uh, climate change right now. Uh, mm. You know, this is not something that's happening in the future. This is something that you guys are dealing with right now. Um, yeah. And it's really devastating. Uh, it, so yeah. if we can yeah, talk about adaptations yeah, sure. and some of the things. So, um, okay, so, uh, so I know, because, okay. yeah, yeah. So what, so, so I was gonna say, what's the biggest adaptation that you think that you have to or, um, deal with at the moment? What's, what, are you, what are the threats and how are you dealing with them? With regard to climate change, as I said earlier, uh, disaster preparedness is the priority right now for us. Um, yeah. We, we are facing so many issues, um, you know, with a direct uh, threat to our lives. Uh, the glacier lakes being one of them, right? Uh, the floods, the yeah. landslides, um, and uh, also um, uh, forest fires, they're a big problem for us. Um, mm. But also um, there, there are other issues which are, which are not so obvious like um, uh, changes in, in the agricultural practices which are required because climate change uh, has also made the temperature warmer um, so that pests are able to come into the, uh, into the village which never used to come. Right, so the, the crops are getting attacked by pests that we never used to see in the high Himalaya. Um, another um, another um, uh, impact is the movement of um, uh, predators from lower right. altitude coming into higher altitude, uh, in particular, uh, the common leopard. So, the oh, okay, leopard, so do you have snow cold. leopards as well? We do have snow leopards. And right, the snow right. leopards, you know, in the past, the snow leopards didn't really have any conflict with um, the local uh, livestock. But the common leopard are much bigger, much more aggressive, and they are attacking the livestock. And in the beginning, when this started to happen about 10, 15 years ago, uh, people used to blame the snow leopards. And the snow leopards mm. are already, you know, a, a very rare, uh, almost, you know, rare, endangered yeah. species, right? So this was creating real conflict between the local people and the snow leopards, turns out there are common leopards who are now moving into the snow leopard territory. Wow. So not yeah. only are the people, were the people upset with the snow leopard, but also the common leopard was eating the food source of the snow leopards. So there right. are so many issues like that. So um, the national park is working on this. The local people are working on it. And, you know, um, I, I, I don't want to paint like a, a, um, a gloom and doom sort of picture, you know, but all these problems there are solutions for them and that's what we're working on yeah so, so it's, it's like you have to work out solutions fast though right because i mean yeah snow, le snow leopards and leopards they had to adapt they usually had millions of years or thousands of years to adapt to new circumstances when climate's changed mm. in the past but the climate is changing so fast that you have to mm. that the adaptations you have to make yeah. are quite extraordinary mm. right so um i think there was a, I, I'm going to ask Ronaldo if that's okay. We had a photo of the, um, that you brought of a, mel, a melting glacier. There we go. Mm -hmm. 
um, is so is that up on the mountain or is that uh, yeah, it also so, looks like it's got a lot of black carbon on it as well. Yeah. Yeah, uh, so this is um, in the Everest region, right? So this is going over the Everest region um, into uh, the next valley over. And the, the mountain passes, many of them have big uh, glaciers like this. And so this is part of the trekking yeah. route, as I was mentioning earlier. Um, but now all these glaciers are melting. So um, it's having a direct impact on, uh, again, the threat to people's lives, because these are the sort of uh, ponds that grow into lakes and then burst out. It, it is also, as you can see here, a, a climber uh, who has boots and crampons on may soon yeah. have to wear flippers <laughs> to cross <laughs> over these ponds, right? So it's having, it, it's, it's um, uh, impacting the tourism industry as well because a lot of these passes uh, are becoming uh, almost impossible to cross now. So, so you get, so you're having um, melting glacial lakes that could uh, outburst. This is causing, can cause landslides. Um, there's also, uh, yeah, it seems like there's like multiple threats and everything becomes mm -hmm. a threat multiplier. Um, there's mm -hmm. also the issues with permafrost as well, right? Yeah. It's making everything shift and, and yeah. permafrost and la melting and landslides. So it yeah, looks so, like this image is, yeah. yeah there, there's that image. Um, so this is in a village called Gorachep, which is the last village before Everest base camp. Um, and right. the permafrost, so the permafrost underneath the village is all melting. And so the land is shifting underneath and all the houses, the buildings are starting to develop cracks and it's becoming dangerous to live in these houses. So there, there's that problem now as well, right? And, uh, and even, uh, and related to this, this is on the lateral moraine of the Kumbu Glacier, uh, you know, the glacier that comes off of yeah. Everest. Yeah. Not only is the permafrost under the buildings uh, melting, but because the glacier, which used to be here, it's- Yeah. It's, it's melted and disappeared. Melting, All the moraine yeah. is starting to collapse in. So wow, because that's you know, what it was like, towards, holding everything up, right? Yeah, it was um, holding everything up. And now all the, that soil is going in there. So in the past, we've already lost a lot of pasture land for our yaks, which used to graze yeah. on, the, on the lateral moraine. But now even the villagers are at threat of one day falling into the glacier. So, uh, you know. So everything's know, moving, so you've got what, yeah, you got all this like water coming down the thread of um, a glacier lake outburst floods. You've got um, a weather events that never happened before, landslides, permafrost mm -hmm. melting. It's everything moving, right? And yeah. and, and it also seems um, strange that so along with the water all coming down the side of the mountain, you've also got water mm -hmm. shortages as yeah. well. Yeah, we have um, we're get, getting uh, problems with water shortages because you know the, the the small glaciers that were on the mountains above the villages they were our yeah. source of, of water during the dry season because we didn't we don't get per, uh, precipitation or we don't get rain or snow for months uh, at a time and so when wow. those those glaciers disappear uh, which they have been doing now for for quite some time um, yeah. people have are having to find alternate sources of water um, there are villages not in the Everest region there are villages more towards the west of um, of Nepal who completely ha had to um, move out all the villages you know the whole settlement had to move away because there's no water there um, my own ancestral wow. village of Kumjung was facing yeah. chronic water shortage um, but luckily because of friends around the world we were able to fundraise and pipe water in from uh, some eight okay. kilometers away right but okay we are lucky because everybody knows Sherpas and wants to help Sherpas but it's not the same case yep. throughout the Himalayas no no, and, and that's the thing, yeah, you know, okay, so but what, what, what you can do and uh, like mm -hmm. what would be good to talk about so we don't make ourselves all very depressed mm -hmm. um, is that the shoppers have gotten a lot of help and a lot of thanks to the blessings of Jomalangmo, I should say, mm -hmm. um, they right. got a lot of attention <laughs> and help <laughs> um, uh, and uh, have been able to come up uh, with uh, some great uh, adaptation strategies. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think yeah. we, that you brought some slides of some of the adaptation strategies um, that you've taken. Mm -hmm. um, I don't. So, so you're so ha, so you're raising money. Is this for, through running? Oh no. So um, this is an event uh, we did early on in, in um, uh, when I first started becoming active on the climate change debate. Um, a lot yeah. of the Sherpas um, uh, didn't actually understand why things were happening the way they were. You know, why is everything melting? Um, at right. one time, I, oh, wow. I asked uh, an elderly Sherpa man, 
Um, and I said, why do you think all the glaciers are melting? And I just had a very candid conversation. And he said to me that in the past, we used to have stone roofs. Now we put tin roofs and it's reflecting, it must be reflecting the sun from our roofs onto the glacier. Wow. And that's how we understood climate change. And yeah, it no, was that makes sense. Wrong, that makes right? sense. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. So that, if, that well, if you don't have a, yeah. yeah, if you haven't and been so, exposed, then that would make sense. Yeah, yeah. And, and and it was so sad for me because like here are these people who had no contribution to to bringing climate change, yet they thought it was their fault yeah. for better, putting better roofs on their own house uh, houses that was causing climate change. And so you know, I I wanted to to you know let the people know that this is climate change. This is why it's happening and what we can do about it. And so I organized events like the Beat the Block Action Run, um, the Kumbu Festival, and I was working with the so youth I, clubs I, and so on. To, I'm just going to interrupt. Awareness. Mm -hmm. to, just so everybody knows, because I'm not sure everyone comes from the mountains, the Glof is the uh, glacial lake outburst flood. And that's mm -hmm. what happens when you get the water from the glaciers melting and building mm -hmm. up and then it builds up pressure and then mm -hmm. it kind of breaks through dams, right? And yeah. not, so, knocks everyone out. Yeah, so, so yeah. So basically the reason I, I'm showing this poster is because mm -hmm. I organized the marathon starting at the lake, which you can see here in the picture uh, in the background. And the, ra uh, the, the run um, route was along the entire length of, of, the, um, of the path of the flood when, if that, if that lake would burst. And so wow. the, the fastest runner um, ran at two and a half, uh, at run it, ran it in two and a half hours. It's predicted that if that water burst out, it would, fi it would finish that race in half an hour. So no, not, not even the fastest runner could outrun that, that glacier lake outburst flood. So the, the point I was trying to make there is that these are not problems we can run away from. These are problems that we yeah. have to face and that we have to solve. Yeah. So that's amazing. That's a really good way to try and, you know, you're you're getting people to think about it, but you're getting them to think about it in a very practical way. It's not yeah. um, just delivering them a bunch of numbers that they may not be able to read. You, it's mm -hmm. it's kind of a performance of what's happening. Quite extraordinary. Well done. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay. So so there's so um, this is more about raising awareness. Mm -hmm. um so uh the uh did and and you had other projects uh yeah. that rona can um, you show the next slide are we on the next oh yeah so this yeah, is you yeah know, it's a group so of, yeah um you know it, i'm one man right and like it's not enough for just one person it's good to be a crusader but it's not enough right so um, we need to have a community of people working together. We need to bring as many people together as possible. So um, I organize different events where I would bring, uh, you know, uh, so in this case, a student, uh, student group directly to the, EC, um, the International Center for Integrated Mountain Development, as they call it, is the scientists who are studying all these glaciers um, and they are doing, you know, groundbreaking work. So I was bringing the, yeah. the youth from the villages and getting them to meet and interact and learn directly from the scientists so that both have an understanding of each other and especially the, right. the young people, uh, you know, going into, you know, into new careers and into their future, understand yeah. climate change and, and understand how they could help, you know? And, and yeah. uh, so it, 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 again, this is something I'm very passionate about, bringing young people in, making them understand and then letting them go out and, and, and um, contribute uh, towards becoming the solution for the future. There can be a disconnect, can't there, between scientists who are trying to do the right thing and put all the information together mm -hmm. and the people on the ground um, mm -hmm. and how they, I mean, you know, if they're thinking that the roofs are causing climate change, then mm -hmm. um, there do, yeah, there does have to be a lot of work putting people together. So, so mm -hmm. okay, so you've got young people, you're getting awareness, um, but mm -hmm. it, so the, um, I just wanted to get back to like the immediate threats. Mm -hmm. So you need to do yeah. um, making people aware so they know how to deal with like mountains changing and the water mm -hmm. changing. Um, you've got agriculture changing. Mm -hmm. and, and you have this idea though, which I think is really interesting. And I wanted to make sure we looked at mm -hmm. that tourism. So a lot of environmentalists are not that stoked on, or they're not, sorry, mm -hmm. that's Australian surf slang. They're not that yeah. happy about tourism. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, you, you're, you're saying that you think tourism can work to help 
um, the locals adapt to the yeah. experiences they're having with climate change. Yeah, yeah? that's correct. Um, so one good thing about the tourism uh, or, or the tourists that come to Nepal are is that they are nature lovers, right? That's why they come right. to the mountains, yeah, yeah. right? They want to see the pristine mountains. And so um, it's a very different mindset from say somebody who goes uh, gambling in Las Vegas. It's a different type of tourist altogether, yeah. right? Yeah. So um, the, the tourism that comes to Nepal by and large, you know, the, the tourists are very aware of, of um, uh, their responsibilities, uh, about their impact. And they also actively choose um, guides or companies to take them to the mountains if, the, if these guides and the, these um, uh, trekking companies are responsible. So, the, you know, it is actually a force for good because it gives mm. people an economic incentive to be responsible. Even if you're the most money-minded person and you're into tourism, you better be a responsible operator because the tourists aren't going to come with you if you don't act that way, right? So yeah. it is yeah, yeah. A, a, a very good um, um, catalyst for change in, in a positive way, tourism is. And so coming back to the adaptation, like I said, in the past, you know, uh, my great grandfather, uh, he was a, he was a, he was a farmer. And uh, when he, you know, when there was no farming, he had to take his horses and his yaks and go to Tibet and trade. And that's how he would supplement his income. That's how he would survive. Yeah. Then tourists came and it brought a lot of income into the region. It allowed people also, um, not only did tourism tourists come into the Everest region, it also opened the eyes of the Sherpas to the rest of the world. So it gave exposure, it gave, it gave the Sherpas network, and it also, uh, a network outside of the Everest region, and it also gave them opportunities to see best practices elsewhere. And they were allowed to right. bring these ideas back to the Everest region. So for example, you know, uh, reforestation programs have been so successful now in the Everest region because we have had Sherpas who studied forestry in Australia, who studied forestry in New Zealand. You know, we've yeah. got doctors who studied in Europe. I mean, it, it's endless, the, the opportunities that tourism, tourism brought for the Sherpas. And so coming again, sorry, coming back to adaptation. Yeah, yeah. If you're economically or if you're financially strong, then you're better able to take care of yourself when yeah. uh, things don't go uh, well, when, when you know, uh, when you have to fend for yourself. When the potatoes don't come, sorry. When yeah. the potatoes I was gonna don't say come. when the potatoes. Exactly, right. yeah. exactly. Yeah, so yeah. Tourism, so, so, tourism really helps in that way. So I was gonna, so then in this case then we've got responding to disasters from movement of the mountains. And then we've got like, yeah, the climate changing so that the pests are coming, you have to figure out new ways to deal with agriculture when the potatoes aren't working and the, um, the leopards are climbing the mountains. And then you have to have like an economic response. So you, you're working on multiple fronts it does sound like that you're making a go of it though you all will seem to be bringing to coming together to make you have a go at being adapting um mm -hmm. but there was another thing that i wanted to talk about before we run out of time and that is mm -hmm. okay you guys are having a go how well are you doing convincing other people to stop um melting your mountains so uh, how, how is how how are you doing with um, advocacy and and working towards mitigation? Uh, it's a process. It's been frustrating uh, at times, right? Right. Um, but at least uh, we've you know we've um, been given the opportunity um, to talk about our problems. People are starting to listen more. Um, I wish they would yeah. listen. You know, they listen uh, and act on it. But at least they're listening. The acting is still a not where it should be, um, but I, I'm not, you know, uh, I'm always optimistic, you know, we have to right. keep knocking on that door because it will, it will open up eventually. Uh, and that's something that I'm very passionate about and I do as much advocacy as possible. Um, and, uh, you know, like I said, you know, um, I, I wish things would move faster, but uh, yeah. you know, it, 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 it's taking its time. We've got a, I think we've got a photo uh, from something that was the um, client, stop climate change, mm -hmm. let the Himalayas live. Mm -hmm. There you yeah. go. Wow, this is like magic. I say it and it appears. Um, yeah. Um, so uh, this was a, this is um, a, a project that it, you worked with World Wildlife Fund and it seems to be working across the Himalaya, not just in the 
mm-hmm. in the in the Chumalangwa region. Is that right? Yeah. So this, um, yeah. I I got together with WWF um, back uh, in two thousand and nine, um, and we wanted to you know it was the the year of COP uh, twenty one I believe it was at that time. Um, I was a COP nineteen. I can't remember. It was a while ago. Um, and um, <laughs> there's been a lot of cops. Yeah, <laughs> there's been a lot of cops. Yeah. and um, we wanted to really raise the issue of the Himalayas melting. And um, so, uh, on the Eco Everest expedition, which I which I was running to, you know, to clean the mountains, we also wanted to stand on the top of the mountain and let you know send out this message that, you know, we need to stop climate change. And in fact, um, this gentleman here, he's a friend of mine. Uh, he was the world record holder for the most summits on Everest, uh, 21. Wow. 21 times. And every time he went to the top, the journalists always wanted a photo of him on the summit. And so, you know, uh, Appa, uh, that's his name, Appa, um, he took this banner up. And when the journalists asked for a photo, that's the photo we gave them, right? So it got printed all over the place. Even in, a, you know, in Georgia, in, in the United States, a friend of mine called me up and said, oh, I saw this amazing picture of APA on the summit with, uh, you know, the message stop climate change. That's fantastic. So, you know, our little effort here was being seen in like rural yeah, Georgia yeah. and the United States. So, but, you know, so we were doing things like that, you know, trying to raise the, the, the profile of the Himalayas in the climate change debate. Well, you kind of speak, um, uh, we, you, I mean, you're speaking with moral authority, right? I mean, the, 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 the people of the land and you haven't done anything and then this is happening from outside of your control and you're having mm-hmm. to learn to adapt to it. I mean, and yes, you've gotten skills to do it, but there is a certain moral authority and you're, you're all talking in this way so that, you know, the people who are doing the damage should maybe listen. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, but, yeah, that's is it, one so, of the unfortunate yeah. things, isn't it? Um, like the Sherpa community, um, we have... I think pretty much zero contribution to climate change. Um, yeah. Yet we are one of the the communities at the the front line of this of this of this battle against climate change. You know we are getting hit really hard, um, and it's just so sad when we see people in the West, um, especially in the West, um, who say, "Oh, climate change doesn't exist. Uh, climate change isn't real." Uh, well, you know, first of all, yes, it is because we we see it and we live through it. And secondly, you know, how dare you? Because you started it and we're having to deal with it. So. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm guessing that there's no climate change deniers in the Chomalangmo region. No. <laughs> there's no one, yeah. <laughs> Everyone can see it and experience it, right? Yeah, yeah, um, unfortunately, yeah. 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 Um, okay, so there's this idea of that need, keeping on needing to, um, uh, to, to make things change, but just to, it, it seems to me that the things that you've been, that you can change, it is up to you, that you've all been working together, like the cleaning up. And the, um, if we can end on a high note, some of the things that have worked. Um, mm. So um, I think uh, the success stories. Um, yeah. So we've got, um, uh, you've been cleaning up and finding historic rubbish, which I'm very excited <laughs> that I have. I don't, know, I don't think anyone else is excited about historic rubbish, but I am as a historian, um, but you, you've got, I think we've got some images of some of the work you've done in order to mm-hmm. um, uh, to remove rubbish from the, mm-hmm. the mountains. So this is um, some of the stuff you had to clean up and that's yeah. not at, uh, is that that's at, the, not at Trommel? Yeah. Yeah, well, it's on the on the back side of Everest. It's on the Lotse side, right? Um, so this right. is Lotse base camp and Lotse, Lotse and Everest are one massive. Uh, so, right. you know, uh, this, this is garbage left behind by, you know, uh, old expeditions who just sort of abandoned everything, just left it like that. So we've been cleaning. Uh, Ronald, maybe um, you can show a picture of uh, the other one, if you can show this. So, so we basically yeah. collect all the garbage. This is, this is at Everest Base Camp. So we collect all the garbage and we separate it, sort it and pack it out. Um, and it, that's been a really great success story um, because I, I can... I can authoritatively say that right now, if you go to Everest Base Camp, you will not find any garbage there right now. Okay? Yeah, right. So yeah. We, we've been so successful in cleaning the mountains. Um, of course, it is on a glacier. So next year, when the, after the summer, when the glacier melts, maybe more garbage will come out. But right now, because I was just there a month ago, uh, cleaning the mountain up, we couldn't find, we, we, 
We collected every bit of wow. garbage from Everest Base Camp. So, uh, you know, th these are success stories that we can be very That's proud really of. That's really amazing. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, okay, so then um, just finishing up so we can have some questions. Mm -hmm. So that makes me think sure. of a final question. And that is, mm -hmm. so you've done, you, you, the, the shoppers, the communities up there that don't have a lot of resources compared, compared to the world, didn't contribute a lot, have been making an effort mm -hmm. to do their bit. What do people around the world need to do to do their bit to, you know, um, try and preserve? I mean, because Jomalamo uh, Everest is not, is your home, but it's also like an icon for the world. Um, so, mm -hmm. what would you? What what should people be doing around the world to be making a difference? What what? How how can the globe citizens help? Um, so, first of all, I would say get involved, right? Um, okay. Don't just talk about it. Get involved with with anything. It doesn't. I get so many emails from people saying, "Oh, I'd like to come to Everest Base Camp and and clean up Everest Base Camp." Well, I said, "Why why don't you start something local, like in your own city?" Yeah. Um, you know, yeah. they're like Kathmandu, for example. You know, there's many cities like Kathmandu who could do with uh, you know some some muscle and, and some you know good souls, right? So yeah. just get involved in in different organizations in your own home. And start there, okay? And uh, if you're a parent or if you're a guardian, right? Get your kids involved early on so that they value um, environmentalism. They value, you know, um, the, the the work because it's not it's not just about cleaning. Um, it's not just about cleaning an environment or cleaning an external area. Uh, that also develops your own inside. Like you, you become a better person from it. You know, you you gain dharma. So you, you are yeah. building better people by cleaning your environment. So start by doing that. Um, the second thing is, which is very important, um, talk to your leaders. Talk to your right. leaders, no matter where you are, whether you're a Nepali in a village or whether you, know, you live in New York City, it doesn't matter. Talk to your leaders and tell them that the human impact on the environment is a threat to humanity. It's not a threat to the planet. Uh, let, let me get this very clear. The planet is doing fine, right? We've had five mm -hmm. mass extinctions till now, right? So mm -hmm. let's not be the mm -hmm. sixth extinction because yeah. it's us that are going to go extinct if we don't take care of the planet. It's not the planet. The planet is going to do fine when we're gone. So <laughs> we want to make sure that we protect the planet so that we protect ourselves. Yeah. Well, that gets back to where, okay, that's a good way because that gets back to exactly where we started. This idea that you have from your grandfather, you look after the mountain, the mountain looks after you. Um, uh, so that's a nice place to, to come back to. So I'm going to move on to the questions. Um, there's a lot of the audience has been asking questions um, that they wanted to put to you. And the first one, which is, uh, you know, is, is interesting because it links into what you're saying. How can we shift our thinking from mountains being massive and eternal to mountains being vulnerable and worth protecting? That strikes me though that. Um, my experience of people in the mountains is that they don't see mountains as being massive and eternal. Um, but maybe that's like, that's a lowlander's view. <laughs> um, but I don't know. I don't know if that's your experience. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, exactly. And actually, that's a very good question because the garbage that we find on the mountains, they're mostly now, like I was showing Ruth the other day, they're garbage from the 60s, the 70s, and the mm -hmm. 80s mostly. And that was a time when people did think of the mountains as massive. And we are just tiny little ants on a mountain and, and the garbage we leave behind means nothing or makes no difference. And because so many people thought in the same way, the garbage piled up. But yeah. today with the mountaineers, um, with the Sherpas, we don't think as the mountains as being massive and internal. We do think of them as being, being vulnerable and, and that we do need to work consciously to protect them. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, yeah, I was thinking about, who, so maybe if you uh, spend a lot of, a bit of time in the mountains, um, then that yeah. idea of them being eternal seems to, to kind of chip away a little bit. Um, yeah. Uh, do you ever have this idea that you're very small next to a mountain though? I'm sure that still comes up occasionally. Oh yeah, of course. I mean, like when you're yeah. on a mountain, <laughs> When, when you're standing on a mountain, um, you feel small, um, but I, I, let me, you feel small, 
and and your life feels small, right? Right. Um, but yeah. at the same time, you feel so connected because you live in the here and now on the mountain, mm. right? Every your your mm. senses are heightened because it's complete survival mode on the mountain. So you feel like you're in tune with the mountain because if you're not, you're not going to survive very long. So it, it's it's such an amazing feeling that you you as an individual you feel so small, but you become connected with the mountain and and the whole world. I, you really need to go to the mountain to, to feel that. Uh, I, I don't know if I can say this over Zoom. I don't know if I can explain that. <laughs> no, I think it's coming across. Uh, I, I think it was interesting. Yes, it's, it's, you can see your enthusiasm. It makes sense. It's a, yeah, um, it's, a, it's interesting. It, yeah. Um, <laughs> okay, we're going to shoot. Uh, we've got to take the smiles away now because I'm, I'm smiling thinking about your enthusiasm. All right, because um, uh, the next question is a bit more serious. It is, uh, what do you think is the role of science in adapting to climate change? Now, yeah, how is science working and what's it not doing well, particularly on the mountain? Okay, um, this is a very good question. And I had a long um, lunch uh, meeting yesterday about this with a bunch of scientists, climate scientists. Uh, um, well, what, Science is doing really well. It, it's filling in the gaps uh, where, you know, um, and so it's informing us where the problems are and how we can tackle them. The problem that I see as a mountaineer myself, and I felt this, is that the scientists aren't communicating with the, the mountain people. So they, mm. the scientists are talking their own language, right? They're, they're science language, right? You can call it that. And then yeah. there's the local people you know, who don't read a 500 page manual about climate change, they, that information needs to be made uh, relevant to them and, act, yeah. and, and actionable for them. And, and that seems to be where a little bit of, uh, of a problem seems to be. And th that's something again, that uh, again, like I said, yesterday I was at a lunch and we were working, we we're thinking about working with the local village municipalities who are the ones who are doing the adaptation work and connecting yeah. them with the scientists so that the work that is being done is better informed and more focused towards solving the problem. It's interesting, they actually, at the university I do my PhD and they had a degree in science communication because there was such a lack of people being able to communicate science that they had to come up with a whole course where people could learn how to communicate it. And, and if you're not someone who's gone past grade 10, um, you know, your, your experience of life is out in the mountains. It would be very tricky. It's, it's, a, it's, in, it's a big, yeah. In fact, you know, it's, it, it's, always, uh, it's also, also a little um, sad uh, because when the two don't talk to each other or communicate with each other effectively, um, what ends up happening is that the local people say, oh, these researchers, they're useless. All they do is yeah. research, 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 and we don't benefit anything from it. We don't learn anything yeah. from it. And then the scientists say, well, what we, we published this 500 page manual. It's, you know, it's in the public domain, right? And yeah. so yeah. there, you know, there's a little bit of friction there because bo the both of them are right in their own way, right? Absolutely. So yeah. it's, we yeah, have yeah. to merge the two, right? And that's, that's yeah. where we need a bridge. I, I, I have this thing that I was learning Tibetan and how to read Tibetan text. And then I was learning Nepali and you had to like learn a certain way to read it. And I feel like when I started reading scientific um, uh, materials, it was like learning Tibetan. You know what I mean? It was so, it was so abstract. It took ages to read it. So I totally got where you're co coming from. It, it's, it's hard to get at and making it easy for people to know is really important. Yeah, um, yeah really. Uh, so speaking of that, then do you think that um, going on from that, do you think this was another question from the audience? Um, so science is kind of maybe disconnecting. Did the, do you think that the voices of the people in the Himalaya were heard in the, all of the COPs that we've had in the Paris Agreement and in all of these international conversations. Do you think that your voice is getting out there? No, I think we're a footnote okay. in the argument, but to be very honest. Oh, like, that's so sad. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah uh, I, you know, I wish, you know, I wish they would see what's going here, uh, going on here in the mountains, um, but unfortunately no. and. The, you know that's the that's the irony in a way because like not only are the mountains melting but the people that live in and around the mountains they are you know you know their lives are in direct threat uh, 
the Antarctic and the Arctic melting is getting a lot more attention. But I feel personally um, that the Himalayas are more important. And I don't say, I'm not saying that because I'm from the Himalayas. I'm saying this because there's a billion and a half people living yeah. to the north of the Himalayas and there's a billion and a half people living to the south of the Himalayas. And they all rely on the waters flowing down from the glaciers of the Himalayas. And to ignore what's going on in the Himalayas is not just an environmental crisis, it is actually a humanitarian crisis because tomorrow when that water dries up and nearly 3 billion people don't have water to drink, don't have water to crop uh, for their crops, don't have water for agriculture or for hydropower, there are going to be huge, huge problems, right? Yeah. And I don't yeah. understand why the Himalayan voice is not being heard. Mm. Yeah, well, um, okay, this is a question kind of connected to that then. There's a, there's a, okay, there's your, we've talked about the community. We've talked about how they're responding to, um, it, with adaptation and how they're having trouble getting their voices out. Um, but there is kind of development being done in the region and you have this issue of being next to a border um, and you also have outside influences. So your presentation of tourism is great because you have local people taking control Mm. Um, they're, 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 um, uh, they're in charge and they can look after themselves. But a lot of the time you get outside influences coming in and taking mm. charge um, mm. and you have international influences and maybe sharper voices get lost because of that. Yeah. Um, so it, it, with, in that regard, do you think that there's a danger that, it, that your voices get, uh, will be co-opted and or the individual voice of the shopper will get lost in that melee. And this is a bit of a segue, but there's, because for example, there's roads being built into the region, right? So if you lose your isolation, if you lose the distinctiveness, um, uh, who, who's gonna speak for them? Do you think anyone will speak for the mountains and, um, or do you think you'll push back against that? That was a, Bad question. Okay, let's start in a second. How do you think the yeah. development and international pressure will affect the sharpers, and how can you mm. see them pushing it back against that? Um, yeah. See, um, the more people are able to visit the mountains, the more they're going to fall in yeah. love with the mountains. And so, I don't believe uh, that the argument or, or, or people who are going to speak for us is going to go uh, be less. I think there are going to be more people talking for the mountains, right? But of course, development has its own, there's, there's a Pandora's box there as well. I, I, I appreciate that. But development, if it's done properly, uh, is going to benefit the local people. And it's also going to have more ambassadors for us going back home. You know, once visit, they visited the mountains, going back home and talking about what's going on in Himalaya. So um, I, I, that, I truly believe that. And I have seen that with my own eyes. Yeah. A lot of my friends, who have climbed with me from Mexico to the US to India, they're also very vocal on climate change um, because you know they're, they're my friends and they've seen, they've climbed with me and they've seen what I've seen. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so that, that's in terms of tourism. Um, so you think that the road coming in, in that case, bringing more tourists in, would they be the same kind of tourists and the same kind of influence that would come in there, learn from the shoppers, uh, learn about the region and take away that message, or do you think it could be it could change the way that people um, relate to that area? Um, I think that uh, there, it will be the same kind of people um, because, like I said before, you know the people who go to the mountains understand that there is a certain amount of discomfort and pain involved, right? Yeah. So uh, you you really do have to love the mountains, or you really would <laughs> do have to have this desire to see the beautiful mountains to come there. And those who don't have that desire don't come to the mountains, even if you can drive right. up there, right? Right. So so you want to make it just a little bit uncomfortable anyway. <laughs> you don't want them it has to, to be a little, <laughs> little bit, a little bit uncomfortable. A little bit uncomfortable. Otherwise, they they wouldn't appreciate it. Okay, that makes sense. Uh, so you so th this particular road you're not too worried about. But if there was like a six lane highway going cutting through the, I mean, like if I if I think about the other side of the mountains, mm. I've been on massive freeways through big tunnels going straight now to the to the north face of Everest. Um, if mm. you have that kind of that kind of development. Um, it could change things. Yeah. Um, well, there's, you know, I'm not, I'm not worried about this road that's coming to the Everest region at all. I'll tell you yeah, what. Yeah, yeah, yeah. First of all, okay. uh, Tibet is flat. 
it's a plateau. Yes, it is. Nepal is the steepest <laughs> yeah. country in the world. So you yeah. you gonna have to dig through the mountains uh, to build a road. Yes. Uh, so it's not as easy yes. as in, in Tibet to build a road, right? You really have to work yeah, yeah. hard at it, right? So that, that, yeah. there's a bunch of logistics and, and funding problems with that, which Nepal, uh, you know, does not have in abundance. So it's not yeah. easy to do that. Secondly, um, we are in a national park and the national park okay. is very powerful in Nepal. And right. the national park, uh, unless the local people demand it, the national park will never um, build a road through it or, or, or allow a road to come up through it. And the Sherpa people yeah. understand the importance of having, um, uh, shall we say, uh, controlling uh, the development happening in the, in the national park. So the consensus is that we don't need a road to come all the way up through the national park. It's good enough that it comes to the edge of the national park, from there people can walk. Right. Yes, I, I, I have to say I hung out with some road workers on the Tibetan plateau who, who were saying their nightmare is working in Nepal. Um, <laughs> it's, like, it's really different, so I can see that happening. All right. That's okay. So I have um, one more question, uh, basically. Um, and so this is there's a lot of people that seem to look up to you, which I mean, the walking up Everest thing is kind of impressive, I have to admit. Um, so uh, and taking people up there and everything and but I don't know I don't I think you think it's normal that you went up there and were like oh I think we need to clean, clean everything up and we need to do all this work and we need to invest so much in looking after the mountains but it's not really normal not everyone's doing what you're doing Dawa um, so it is kind of inspirational to, to other people um, so I was wondering uh, what how you motivate yourself right and what you would say to people who are young students and uh, to other people who want to work towards climate action is what motivates you and what do you think could motivate them to do more action? Oh, um, well, that's a, what motivates me. I think yeah. um, when I like, uh, how do I say this? Um, you know, like every, every person, should leave the world in a better place than when they found it, when they were born. That's my belief, right? So I want to leave the yeah. planet when I, when I die, I want to leave the planet better off than when I found it. That's so it's just that sort of feeling of like, you know, I have to do good. Um, I, you know, I have to con continuously strive to make things better. Um, that, that sort of, you know, motivates me. And, um, I, I am someone who values, um, you know, values uh, getting my hands dirty. Uh, I don't know, it's just something very, very meditative about it, you know? Um, yeah. I just, I, I, I don't like complaining too much. I know today, you know, I was complaining a lot or maybe I was talking a lot about the problems, but um, it's such a fantastic feeling to be able to solve problems. It's just, it's addictive in a way. And um, so I'm always looking, you know, I, I, I see problems as opportunities uh, to make things better. So maybe that's what it is. Right, okay. So it's, <laughs> it's, 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 it's an attitude towards the problems, right? So even the, something as huge as climate change on in a very vulnerable uh, situation or vulnerable mm -hmm. environment, your idea is, okay, how do we deal with this as opposed mm -hmm. to being freaked out by it? Yeah, I mean, um, yeah. I think maybe, maybe um, Maybe this, is, this explains a bit better. Um, all the problems that we face, that we're facing right now, they were created by us, by us human beings. So therefore, I also believe that we can create, we humans can create the solutions for them. It's that yeah. simple for me. So. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense, yeah. Yeah, we need, probably need to get more humans on board. So if we can have yeah, the, well, that's the, the young people, it, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, to be able to work for, towards it. Um, so I think that we're almost out of time. So we've gone through a lot of things. Um, um, yeah, and we've been uh, hosted um, this evening by the Geopolit Geopolitics and Ecology of Himalaya Water Initiative that uh, as I said at the beginning, is being run through NYU Abu Dhabi and the Rachel Carson Center in, in Munich in Germany. But um, yeah, so just uh, wrapping up, um, is there 
uh, anything that you want to leave people with? Any final words from the mountains that you think that they should um, be focused on? Uh, yeah, um, there's a lot of people out there um, who think they can't make a difference in the world, that they're only one person and, you know, um, that what they think and what they do makes no impact. And unfortunately, you know, there are 7 billion people and many people like think the same way. So what I would say is that I'm, I also used to think that, that I couldn't make a difference. And, you know, I'd like to think I have made a difference, whether I have or not is, you know, is, is, is a secondary matter, but I've at least, you know, I, I've taken the steps and a lot of people don't even take the step to, you know, the, that first step to do something about it. So if there are people out there, I know most of you are, you know, you've already taken the step, those who are listening here, because, you know, we're, you're, you've listened to an hour of me ram rambling on about this. So you've, already, <laughs> you've probably already taken the step. But I do want to give that message that, you know, yes, one person does make a difference. So everybody, if everybody thought in that way, we could very, very quickly solve this problem. Excellent. All right. So that, that's a very good positive, um, a very positive and inspiring way to end. And I think that's like something that I've taken from this tonight is, um, yeah, it's to focus on being uh, positive and looking for solutions as opposed to being overwhelmed by problems. It's a great, a great, uh, a great something to share. Thank you so much. And um, I think now we can all just say goodbye. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Do you say, do you say Kalishu, where you're from? No, we, we just say bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs> <laughs> right. Take care, everybody. Yeah, bye. bye.